you have um, your great lab, Dr. Hausman, who's going to lecture today on hypercholesterolemia. Super important material. Um, but I, I'm here to remind you that we have a quiz on Monday over the coagulation stuff. And it will be specifically on the coagulation. So if you don't know what our favorite vitamin K antagonist is, you better know by Monday <laughs> <laughs> and what, what that does. In the K. So anyway, quiz on Monday. Don't forget. And it will be... Well, I think we'll do it at the first part. So the first part of class will be like 15 minutes or so. And then um, and then you'll have your class afterwards. And then on Wednesday, I'll go over the, the answers for the quiz. And I'll go over the test as well. And the test is great. And I'm going to go enter those scores. Um, now, I'm going to release them after this class. So Thank just you. Don't, look. <laughs> <laughs> don't look for your score. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you could have somebody doing swooning in the back, and like whatever. But yeah, I mean, the average was 82, so somebody got 100. Um, actually, don't know, but it was the the, the range was from 100% um, down to um, pretty low. So <laughs> good luck. Quite as deep as his, but um, it's nice to be back. He's all wound up about that quiz next week, so please do well because I'll never hear the end of it because my office is right next to his and we're best friends and I hear everything. Okay, so, um, so we're going to talk today and Monday about dyslipidemia. So. Because of all this wonderful snow and because of the quiz, we're going to have to kind of compact two full lectures into sort of a lecture and a half. But I think you've had the slides for a little while. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you've looked at them, but you have the slides. Um, I don't need to read them to you, but we're going to walk through them and spend a bit of time talking about this because, as you probably know, uh, pretty much everybody on a Western diet is facing this situation in one form or another. So that's why we give you two lectures in a semester that's action-packed with all sorts of stuff is because you're going to be seeing a lot of patients that are struggling um, with lipid disorders. So let's walk through this together. And as usual, if you have any questions, let me know, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, can you guys see this picture? Mm -hmm. I know, I, it's kind of weird in here. How many of you have any sort of clinical experience where you've seen blood that's taken from patients? Have you ever seen anything like this? I mean, one of, one of the sort of weirdly gross, interesting things about lipid metabolism is you can see lipids in plasma, especially when there's dysregulation. So these are samples from a patient with normal, normal lipids or lipemic patient. This is actually quite common and you can look at it and tell. So you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure out that the plasma from this patient, um, there's something going on there. So what are the learning objectives for today and Monday? Um, the first two are about reviewing. Hopefully this is material that at some point in your academic career you've heard in physiology and biochem and patho, but we're gonna review it. Because lipid metabolism is actually really complicated and not because I want you to memorize lipid metabolism, but what I want to do as we go through this review is I'm going to have in red bold fonts, I apologize for any of you who can't see the color red, but drug targets. So we're going to review the mechanisms, we're going to review the physiology, and when there's a drug target, it's going to be in bold and red. Okay? So that's probably something you should know because that's where our drugs are working. Um, so point number three, we're going to identify those key regulatory steps and lipid pathways that serve as drug targets. And then in the second slide deck, we're going to talk about the drug classes that are used to treat. And once again, um, just like last semester, I will give you examples of drugs from the class. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of the drugs in the class, but you should know how those classes work. And if there's specific drugs I mentioned, that's fair game or whenever. 
Dr. Salvage put this one with me. Okay, so dyslipidemia, um, an introduction. So <coughs> hopefully you know that lipids float around in plasma, complex in things called lipoproteins because they're complex with proteins. All right, so it gives you the answer. Kind of like drugs often travel around a plasma complex to proteins. Um, just some vocabulary, which should be a review. You'll hear things like hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia. Those pretty much are used interchangeably. Um, as opposed to hyperlipemia or hypertriglyceridemia, that's talking about lipids versus phospholipids. So triglycerides, what's a triglyceride? It's glycerol with um, three fatty acids. Yeah, tri, three fatty acids hooked onto a glycerol backbone, okay? That's how fat floats around mostly. So if you've got really high fat in your blood, you have hypertriglyceridemia or hyperlipemia, but if your lipoprotein meta uh, profile is screwed up, we're talking dyslipidemia. So just some, some jargon you're going to hear, and sometimes these words are pretty similar, just to, to be on the lookout for the differences there. What happens if we have hyperlipidemia? Well, two things. One that you probably are more familiar with is atherosclerosis, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit of a detail, but also acute pancreatitis, and this can be life-threatening. So patients who have very high triglyceride levels can have acute pancreatitis. So inflammation of the pancreas, it can kill you. So serious stuff. So let's start with what's normal in lipoprotein metabolism. So as the name suggests, it's lipids complex with proteins. They float around in little balls. They're actually spheres. So they're hydrophobic <coughs> in the middle. That's where all the fat's floating around. And on the outside, you have the more water-soluble components, such as proteins, such as apoproteins, which we're going to talk about. There's a table in the book I will not make you memorize. It's also in the supplementary slides if you want to look at it which talks about classes of lipoproteins. Just to list them, we have chylomicrons, VLDL, IDL, <coughs> LDL, HDL, all of these you've heard of, right? You may not remember the details, but you've heard of these things. And also lipid, lipoprotein. So these are the classes of lipoproteins in human plasma. And they have, each have distinct <coughs> metabolism, distinct functions, and can be distinctly dysregulated in patients, okay? So if you want more detail, Table 31.1 has that detail. In the most trivial sense, these things have their names because they have different densities. And you can look at this table, these are just two columns taken on that big table, and what do you see? Really big differences in density and really big differences in diameter. Chylomicrons are huge, and they're not very dense. Why, why such a variation in density? Any idea? Packing arrangement. Packing arrangement. Packing arrangement? Not exactly, but it's a good answer. What is density? What are these things made up of? I just told you what they're made up of in general. Fat and protein. Which is more dense, fat or protein? Protein. protein. So, if you're big and not very dense, what are you probably made up of? Protein. Fat. Big enough. <laughs> <laughs> He's participating in class and I love it. <laughs> My brain was the opposite. It's all right. So the big difference here is the big thing that isn't very dense has a lot more fat versus protein. 
So high density lipoproteins have the most protein, right? That's that's where the names come from. Okay, and this is just a picture of kind of what this lipoprotein ball looks like. It's very spherical. As I said, on the inside you have the triglycerides and cholesterol esters. Um, here you have these apoproteins. These are very important proteins that we're going to talk about that are either on the periphery of this sphere or integrated into it. Okay, so just to help you visualize what these spheres are that float around your plasma. So what about apolipoproteins? There's another massive table in the book. It's also in your supplementary slides in the back. They give all sorts of details about apolipoproteins. What I want you to know is I've distilled a lot of this information out, so you don't have to regurgitate the table. But these things are pretty important, and it's pretty complicated um, the way this process is, is regulated. So these things are major components of lipoproteins. One of the things they do is they give stability to all that fat, right? So it, it, it gives stability, it gives the structure to that sphere. That's probably the least important thing that it does. These proteins serve as ligands. Remember ligands from last semester? Hormones are ligands, drugs are ligands. Apoproteins are ligands. And they bind to receptors, and this is important to the lipid metabolism. They can also act as cofactors in various enzymatic reactions that are involved in lipid metabolism. So again, from a mechanistic point of view, they play a very important role. Um, with the exception of APOA, they have amphipathic helices. What is that? Does anybody remember that from biochemistry? They're very small going. Yep. They've got both lipid loving and lipid phobic regions, right? So they can interact with aqueous solutions. They can also interact with fat, okay? Which is important when you think about what they're doing, okay? They're part of this lipid, lipid sphere floating around, but they're also in plasma, which is aqueous, okay? So, Differences in the non-lipid binding regions of these proteins determine their functional specificity. Functional specificity. That differences in those regions determine their specific functions in the body. Okay. So that's apoproteins. What about cholesterol? Is cholesterol good or bad? Both. It's both. Okay, so what does it do? Well, it's an essential component of your cell membranes. You guys know this, so if you don't have it, you die. So cholesterol is quite important. It's involved in the synthesis of things like vitamin D, steroid hormones we talked about last semester, bile acids we're going to talk about in a few minutes. It's stored in cells as esters, not as free. Cholesterol, so it's sterified. Um, where does it come from? You guys know this. Where do we get cholesterol from? Diet. Diet is a very important source, and we also make it ourselves. So. For people who are not vegan, okay, about 25% of our cholesterol comes from our diet, so a lot of it, okay, from animal protein sources. However, every cell in your body can make it, because remember, you got to have it for your cell membrane to be intact. So every cell can make it, and it's very tightly regulated, and 75% of it comes from de novo synthesis. We know de novo means new synthesis. Um, and most of it takes place in the liver, but a lot is made in the intestine as well. Okay. 
So the irreversible rate limiting step in this cholesterol biosynthetic pathway is HMG-CoA reductase. Why do we care? Bold and in red. This is the drug target for statin drugs that we're going to talk about in the next slide deck. So in case you've forgotten, quite often irreversible rate limiting steps and pathways are great places to target for drugs. Okay? So if you want to lower cholesterol, that's a great target. Okay. So diet, cholesterol and lipid metabolism. I put humans here. Humans have very different lipid and cholesterol metabolism than <coughs> rodents, for example, which are all of our preclinical species for drug development. All right? So human metabolism is quite different. Um, when you eat something that has cholesterol in it, either from an animal source or plant sterols, you absorb it in your intestine by this thing called NPC1L1, which happens to be a drug target. Okay? So this protein is involved in absorbing cholesterol from the diet. What's interesting is the sterols in plants, unlike the sterols in a steak, aren't usually absorbed and converted into these chylomicrons like the cholesterol from the steak because we have ABC transporters. Who remembers ABC transporters? Does anybody remember that? Last semester, maybe. <coughs> so basically, these ABC transporters, bless you, bless you, bless you, <laughs> shoot the cholesterol from the plant sources back out into the intestinal lumen to go passing out of your body. Okay? This is the figure from last semester. Anybody remember this? See, it all works together. And it's just to remind you, vectoral transport, here's that ABC transporter. So if the plant sterol is taken up, that ABC transporter can shoot it right back out so it doesn't shove in your bloodstream the way cholesterol from the hamburger does. So, triglycerides. We said triglycerides are a glycerol backbone with three fatty acids stuck off of it. A rate limiting enzyme in this pathway is called diacylglycerol transferase. This is a potential drug target. I say potential, there are drugs in clinical development for this, haven't hit the market yet, but this is an important one. If you have a hard time remembering this thing, di means two acylglycerol transferase. So that's a path that's putting that second glycerol on that backbone. Okay? It's a stepwise process of adding fatty acids to the backbone. All right. So this enzyme is expressed in a lot of places, but importantly, the liver and small intestine. So in human beings, you're talking lipid metabolism, your liver and your small intestine are where most of it's going on. So when in doubt, guess those two tissues, okay? It's different if you're a different species. So, once you make the triglyceride in your endoplasmic reticulum, it gets transported by this thing called microsomal triglyceride transport protein, MTP. It is a drug target we're going to talk about, all right? So it transports the triglyceride to a place where the apoprotein can be stuck on it, and you can make a column all right? Drug target. <clears throat> I told you that dietary cholesterol needs to be esterified. It's esterified by this ACAT2 enzyme expressed in your intestine and your liver. All right? So here is another um, important regulatory step that 
in the intestine is involved in the absorption of dietary cholesterol, it's a potential drug target. It's in development. So if you can limit the absorption of cholesterol, you have less to metabolize and deal with if you have a problem with cholesterol metabolism. Okay? Okay, so those are some key regulatory um, points that we're going to be talking about drugs to treat. Um, in terms of classes, we have chylomicrons. These are the big fat ones, remember? These come from fatty acids from your diet and cholesterol. <clears throat> All of this is happening in the small intestine. So you absorb um, fat. Um, once, once these are made, they flow through the thoracic ducts into the subclavian veins and float around. They are the largest <coughs> plasma lipoproteins. Um, if you take that plasma sample that I showed a picture of and you just let it sit on the bench, you don't have to centrifuge it, these things are going to float all by themselves. They're so big. Okay? If you, um, <coughs> and this is due to their high fat content, so we've talked about that. Triglyceride to cholesterol ratio is greater than 10. Okay? So there's a lot of fat on there. So if you're a normal life, um, like pediatrician, if you do not have a disorder, if you eat a McDonald's meal three to six hours after that meal, we'll find these in your plasma. But after you fast, we won't. Okay, that's an quote unquote normal person. If you've got a disorder in chylomicron metabolism, they're going to be there all the time. Okay? This is a cartoon from the book. From the book that is the picture of what a lot of these word slides are going to talk about in terms of this process. Um, here we have the intestine. So you eat a meal. So there's dietary fat and cholesterol coming in. Chylomicrons are made. Um, an important uh, player here, LPL, that stands for lipoprotein lipase. What's a lipase? Break. It's an enzyme that breaks down fats. So this is a an enzyme that breaks down lipoprotein lipids, and in you and you get free fatty acids, and you get what's left over, and these can be taken up by the liver. There are receptors for these things on the liver. Fatty acids can be taken up by your adipose tissue, other tissues. They can go to the liver. The liver can crank out the LDL that we're going to talk about. Again, this lipoprotein lipase enzyme can liberate fatty acids, generate IDLs, LDLs. So this is the picture of what I've provided you slides and words to talk about. All right? Kind of a complicated process. So. As I said, these chylomicrons that enter from the gut are metabolized by this LPL um, enzyme. This enzyme lives on your capillaries. It lives on your capillaries. It's a triglyceride hydrolase, so it cuts those fatty acids off. Here's where it's expressed in your fat, your skeletal muscle, your heart. And if you're a lactating woman, expression goes up because you need fats to make milk for the baby, okay? So if you're um, right before you um, give birth and as you're lactating, LPL activity goes up in the breast. Um, so LPL cuts the fatty acids, liberates them, they can be taken up by tissue. So for this to happen, you have to have this apoprotein, APOC2, it's an absolute cofactor, which means you have to have it for this reaction to take place. If you don't have it, or if your LPL enzyme is screwed up, you get chylomicronemia syndrome, okay? So it's severe hypertriglyceridemia, 
and pancreatitis. I told you that pancreatitis can happen when your triglycerides are all screwed up. So either a dysfunctional LPL enzyme or lack or dysfunction of that apoprotein, and this is how you get this symptom. The enzyme also um, is involved in taking up a lipoprotein um, in the artery wall. So we're going to talk in a few slides about atherosclerosis. But part of what goes on in atherosclerosis is the accumulation of lipids in the artery wall. And this happens, this LPL is playing a major role in insulin resistance. This enzyme is regulated by insulin, okay? So that's what's going on in this scenario. This is important. The amount of chylomicron you have floating around in your blood system can only be controlled by reducing dietary fat consumption. We have no therapeutic drug which will increase the breakdown of chylomicron. The only thing you can do, if you're a type 1 diabetic, what's a type 1 diabetic? If you are a type 1 diabetic, you do not have insulin. You do not have insulin. So if you're a type 1 diabetic and I give you insulin, that will improve your lipid profile because you don't have any insulin. Other than that, we have no therapeutic available to reduce chylomicron. So if you have a disorder, it's all about diet, severe dietary restriction. Okay, chylomicron remnants. So this is what you have after you um, have hydrolyzed the fats and these chylomicron remnants, so, so all of this is happening at the capillary. You have LPL hanging out there, chylomicron comes through, LPL does its thing, it releases the remnant, and it's cleared by the liver. The liver's trying to get this stuff out of your blood, right? This doesn't just happen, it's mediated by APOE. So here's another apoprotein that's involved in lipid metabolism. So these remnants contain all of your dietary cholesterol that you've absorbed into your body. Right? That's what they're full of. So during this process, um, <coughs> we get APOA1, and these phospholipids are removed from the surface of the chylomicron, and these are precursors for high-density lipid proteins. They're precursors. They are not precursors for LDL. They are not precursors for LDL, but they can increase plasma LDL because they reduce LDL clearance by the liver. Okay? VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. So these are produced by the liver. On that picture, if you remember, the liver can shoot these things out. And this happens when you have a lot of fatty acid synthesis going on, and there are lots of things that can stimulate that in the liver. These things are large, but they don't float the way chylomicrons do. Um, <coughs> They are, they have multiple apoproteins, multiple here. Once again, this MTP enzyme, the drug target, is responsible for transferring the triglyceride to hook up with these apoproteins. Okay, so like chylomicrons, the lipoprotein lipase enzyme can cleave off the fatty acids. Um, that's a similar mechanism. And then the remnants, like the chylomicron remnants, they're VLDL remnants, they're called IDL, okay? 
but these are released and re-enter the circulation. So similar to the chylomicrons, but not as big, and they come from the liver instead of from your intestine. Okay. So once again, APOE plays a big role in the metabolism of these lipoproteins. All these different um, lipoproteins are regulated by APOE metabolism, and so if you have a mutation in your APOE gene, you can have all sorts of dyslipidemia. And in fact, there are quite a few known uh, mutations in this gene. Unit. And we don't really have time to talk about it, but how many of you have heard of familial hypercholesterolemia? Yeah, so these are folks that for genetic reasons, no matter what they eat, no matter how thin they are, how much they exercise, whatever, their lipoproteins are screwed up. This is one of the genes that can be involved in that. Okay, LDL, the one we call the bad cholesterol. Here's a little cartoon of what it looks like. Why is it bad? You guys know this, come on. It's so oh. Low density lipoprotein, more fat. Not exactly. It's sticky. What's what's LDL known for? He knows. Come on. Atherosclerosis. Okay. You guys know this stuff. These things are atherogenic, so they deposit cholesterol in your arterial walls, forming plaques, okay? That's what this stuff does. It is very sticky. They come from the breakdown of IDL. What are IDL? I just told you. The LDL remnant, right? Now, this is interesting. The half-life of this thing is one and a half to two days. VLDL, IDL, 30 to 60 minutes, all right? So these things stay around a long time in your bloodstream, which gives them more and more chances to stick to arteries, right? Because they're zooming around. Big difference. If you do not have hypertriglyceridemia, typically two-thirds of your plasma cholesterol is found in this form, right? Now, apolipoprotein B100 <coughs> is the only apoprotein in this thing. I told you VLDL has what, four or five? This has one, and this is the ligand for the LDL receptor, and that is important. Why is that important? So hepatocytes, those are liver cells. Eliminate cholesterol from plasma by secreting in bile and conversion to bile acids. Clearing LDL out of your plasma happens via this LDL receptor. All right? The vast majority of LDL is cleared via this receptor, and most of it's found in your liver. So about 75% of the LDL floating around your blood cleared by the liver. So if you want to modulate clearance out of plasma, impacting LDL could be a wise thing to do. There are over 900 mutations in this receptor. Over 900. Again, this is an underlying factor in some forms of familial hypercholesterol. So if your receptor doesn't work or it's not there, you can't clear that LDL of your plasma, it just stays there. Okay? That's the functional consequence. This thing was discovered by Brown and Goldstein. For those of you who love to read these things, there's, they want to know the prize for it when they were studying familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, it mediates the endocytosis of cholesterol-rich LDL. So endocytosis, taking something into a cell, all right? It's a regulated process. Plathrin-coated pits, 
It's not simple diffusion, it's a regulated process. And the expression of this receptor is regulated by how much cholesterol you have. Here's a cartoon of it. Really big, big binding domain out here. You have a transmembrane domain. And here's the cytosolic tail, which is involved in once that cholesterol comes in, or that LDL comes in, um, targeting it to the, the platinum pit so it can be trafficked away. Okay, lipase A lipoprotein. This thing is formed by hooking up LDL and A protein with a disulfide bridge. All right, so bad cholesterol plus this thing equals something very bad. A protein is homologous to plasminogen. Who knows what plasminogen is involved in? <coughs> Dr. Selvich, quiz on Monday? <laughs> okay, it's involved in that. So, what are the implications? These things are found in atherogenic plaques in large quantities. These things are high in sites of inflammation. Okay. Thought to contribute to cardiovascular disease by inhibiting thrombolysis. Okay. If you have a, a mutation in this gene, this specific one, very strongly correlated with coronary heart disease. Okay, HDL, the good one. Look at all that's going on in that. <coughs> There's a lot going on in there. It's the smallest. It's got the most protein. That's why it sinks. It's high density. Okay? Very complex metabolism. Not surprising. Um, the apoproteins for this thing are made in liver and intestine. Um, the lipids come from chylomicrons and VLDLs. Cholesterol from peripheral tissues, not diet. That's going to become important. Cholesterol from peripheral tissues. Why is it good? Why is it good? Everybody knows you want to raise your HDL. Why is that? Come on, guys. It's protective. It reduces your risk of coronary heart disease, so that's why you want more of it in plasma. And it's cardioprotective, so there's a couple of things going on. One of those things is reverse cholesterol transport. Now, this is why it's important to know that the cholesterol from these things comes from peripheral tissue, comes from other areas, okay? So the HDL can actually take cholesterol away from places like atherogenic plaques and get rid of it. And get rid of it. Okay? And the enzyme that's involved with this is cholesterol ester transferase protein, CETP, was a huge drug target. This was the drug target for the drug that almost put Pfizer out of business when it failed in phase three clinical trials when I worked there. Okay, um, this is the enzyme that's involved in helping to get cholesterol out of places like plaques. It's also thought that HDL is protective because it has anti-inflammatory, antioxidative, anticoagulant effects. Okay, so it's more than just getting rid of cholesterol, it reduces inflammation. And we do believe and know that much of cardiovascular disease and diabetes are, are their inflammatory diseases, okay? So anti-inflammatory. APOA1 is the major apoprotein, and it is a more powerful inverse predictor of cardiovascular disease than HDL. What's an inverse predictor? Any idea? Inverse predictor. So if you have high APOA1, you have a lower risk of heart disease. 
So a direct predictor would be high increases. This is high decreases. That's an inverse predictor. Okay. So it's a better predictor actually than HDL. Okay. okay just some review. Um, these things are regulated by estrogens and androgens. This is why women tend to have higher HDL than men. There is a genetic component. It does respond to lifestyle, um, increases with exercise, weight loss, <coughs> light to moderate alcohol. Um, if you stop smoking, great things happen to your HDL, <coughs> and dietary changes. <coughs> and also, that this Mediterranean diet. Um, one, I think this is the last thing on metabolism that we need to talk about to prepare for the drugs, and these are bile acids. So these things are made in the liver from cholesterol, okay? So it's stored in the gallbladder, and it's involved in, they act as detergents, okay? So they help to digest fats in less than 500 mg. Um, escapes reabsorption. So most of it's reabsorbed. They act as detergents to keep fats in solution. They're involved in the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. Um, they accelerate pancreatic lipase. Um, colorectic action, they stimulate the liver to secrete bile, um, stimulate intestinal motility, and keep the cholesterol in solution. This will become uh, part of a discussion on drug targets as well. So the final bit of this um, is the stuff I really hope you remember, and that is um, the relationship to coronary heart disease. We know it's a big problem. It's associated with high LDL <coughs> and triglycerides and low HDL. Um, there's lots of other things that are um, components, including smoking, diet, diabetes, and aging. I put this figure up here. This is a study that uh, we talk about a lot, showing the relationship between reducing plasma cholesterol and reduction in cardiovascular events. And basically, what this shows is the more you reduce plasma cholesterol, the fewer um, cardiovascular events you have. The big question is, is how low can you go? So people who think about statin dosing and pushing statin dosing this has caused a lot of conversation. Um, lipoprotein disorders. So historically, what was done was you measured lipids in patients, and if you look at this table of guidelines about where your lipids should be, the table is in your supplementary slide, these are NECP guidelines. This is historically how we have dealt with patients to diagnose and treat. And then in November of 2013, it all changed. So last year, this came out right before I taught this. Um, there were new guidelines on how to manage patients to replace those guidelines we've used forever. Um, and really, the previous guidelines were all about monitoring plasma lipids. The whole thrust here was to improve and simplify statin use guidelines and improve, it, improve cardiac outcomes. It caused a huge amount of controversy. I don't know, have any of you heard about this? A lot of controversy. So the radical change from what we did before, and yes, this is therapeutics, but you need to know this stuff. The radical change is prescribing moderate to high intensity statins for patients 40 to 75 with predicted seven and a half or higher 10 year risk without a requirement for monitoring lipids. So why is this so controversial? Where they created this algorithm to calculate what your risk is to determine if you should be put on a statin. There's lots of questions about how well validated that algorithm is. Is it evidence-based? Um, a lot of con conversations about, are we gonna start treating patients who don't need to be treated? Um, what is there risk to this? There was a whole flurry in the field around this, but this is where it's moved, okay? So that's where it's going. <clears throat> Hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis. I think you know what atherosclerosis is. It can lead to blockage of the artery. It's a chronic inflammatory event. 
it involves accumulation of macrophages and bone cells. These are macrophages that have taken up a lot of LDL, all right? That's what's going on that artery. So there are different sorts of plaques. Um, they are composed of cholesterol crystals. They can be stable or unstable. The unstable ones are the more ones that are more likely to cause you to stroke out. The unstable ones have more of these macrophage and foam cells, so they're more inflamed. Okay? The unstable ones are more inflamed. This is just a picture of a blocked artery. Um, so this is treating this is more than just reducing the size of the plaque. So a lot of the push behind this aggressive lipid lowering with high dose statins is that you can have effects beyond just the size of the plaque and reducing the size of the plaque. Although a very small increase in diameter can have a huge positive effect. So there are data that show if you aggressively lower lipids, you can change endothelial dysfunction. So those are the cells in your aorta, right, or your arteries that are sp have spasm or plaque stability issues. Um, just want to get through this because we're running short on time. So aggressive lipid lowering with statin changes the architecture of this plaque. It reduces the lipid and the macrophage content, um, and it impacts the amount of collagen and the, the integrity of those smooth muscle cells. Uh, plaque stabilization is related to lowering LDL cholesterol. This is just a picture. You can look at the different components. These are macrophages that have invaded. Hypertriglyceridemia, again, this is also associated with elevated cardiovascular disease. This is a component of the metabolic syndrome. You all remember what metabolic syndrome is? Pre-diabetes. These are things which can, these are disorders that can cause dyslipidemia. Diabetes, alcohol, contraceptives, um, hormone replacement, elevated glucocorticoids, hypothyroidism. So lots of patients are going to fall in those categories, right? And these are the specific effects on lipids. So you're going to see lots of patients with these disorders. And the final thing from this lecture is to remind you that type 2 diabetes is associated with severe dyslipidemia. Um, I think I mentioned this last semester. What did diabetics die of? Heart disease. Heart disease. So type 2 diabetes is an independent predictor of high risk for cardiovascular disease. What does that mean? Morbidity is two to four times higher if you have type 2 diabetes. Mortality from cardiovascular disease is 100% higher in type 2 diabetics versus non-diabetics. Diabetics die of heart disease. If you get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes today, you are also diagnosed with heart disease even if you don't have it yet. All right, that's functionally what this means for your patients. If we look at those patients specifically, they have very high triglycerides, they have reduced HDL, increased LDL, and total cholesterol. So every single step, every one of those is dysregulated, okay, not just one. Glucose control will not fix it. So I preached glucose control to you last semester to prevent, you know, complications of diabetes. Glucose control is critically important, but it will not solve this problem. And that is why statins are first-line therapy for diabetic patients. Um, there is a required supplemental reading um, for these two lectures, it's posted to Blackboard. Um, I've actually posted this entire document. You don't have to read the entire document. This is a new standard of care for diabetes. This is the kind of stuff you're going to be spending a lot of time in therapeutics. But this section, pages 49 to 57, 
specifically talks about cardiovascular disease and dyslipidemia in diabetics. I'm presenting much of it, but instead of me assigning a book chapter to you, that's what I'm assigning for your reading, so it's required. Okay. I was hoping to get to the next lecture. I didn't get there, so I'll see you on Monday after the quiz, and we will get the drugs.